Nick Redfern again on Epic Voyages, and our guest this evening is Gary Hesseltine, and we're talking about a wide range of subjects, particularly um, Gary's research into UFO encounters in the UK involving British police officers, but also his sort of very proactive research and investigations, and, and just general digging into other aspects of the UFO field as well. And one of the things I want to bring up with you, Gary, is apparently you've got a new online magazine. Uh, can you talk about that and what it is and its goals and so on? Yeah, uh, th thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Yeah, uh, re realistically, uh, about a year before I decided to retire, I, ca I had the idea, I think it was in August of 2000 and... Uh, and uh, ooh, 2012, so 2012, so maybe about seven months before I actually retired, to launch a an online magazine. Um, obviously, over the last 11 years of doing UFO conferences and meeting various uh, researchers from around the world, and obviously as I've got more well known within the field, I've obviously pretty much met everybody who was anybody, uh, and uh, it, I often thought that after. Graham Birdsell died uh, and uh, UFO magazine closed. I still think that was the best UFO magazine there's ever been. And yes, magazines have come and gone and there are other publications out there. Uh, but for me, there was something missing. Uh, and so in retirement, I thought, well, what do I want to do? I want to continue my research, but I want to be involved in trying to, I guess, kind of lead certainly the UK front uh, with a positive uh, role, uh, carry, kind of carrying on uh, uh, Graham's work. And so I had the idea to launch uh, the magazine. I went uh, to the Exopolitics Conference in Liverpool. I spoke with a number of uh, UK researchers there. Uh, and I said, look, I did this idea. Would you be columnists? You know, would you contribute? And they all said yes. So it kind of gathered from there. And then I spent several months contacting various researchers around the world. Uh, Susan Hansen in New Zealand, very prominent. And Mary Rodwell in Australia, well, who's one of the top people in the abduction field experience. Uh, Bill Chalker, the Oz Files in Australia. Um, Peter Robbins in the States, well known, the left of East Gate. AJ Javad in Brazil. Roberto Pinotti uh, in Italy. Uh, Pia Nudson, who's a, a new uh, researcher from uh, Denmark, uh, Exopolitics Denmark. Uh, and, and a host of UK researchers to begin with, uh, they all shared the idea that it was a you know a good idea, and so realistically, I then set about plans to make it work. Uh, and the good news is that those plan plans came to fruition on June the 25th, when the first issue, uh, it's a 96-page colour e-zine uh, for your iPad, etc., your iPhone. Um, it's not in print. It never will be in print because the cost factors are too prohibitive. Uh, but with no, effectively no overheads, it's the perfect medium now. Uh, after Graham Birdsell died, I, for, for three and a half years, I ran a little monthly uh, uh, magazine called ufomonthly.com. But then people hated to read off a computer screen. And so people would print it off or ask me to print it off. Uh, and that, which was a bit of a pain, really, but people hated to read off the screen. But now with the advent of tablet technology and smartphones, then people are quite happy to read off the Kindle, the Kobo, the iPad, the iPhone, the smart Android phones, etc. So now that it struck me is that if you're going to do this, uh, the time was now to, to launch it. So we launched on the 25th. Uh, we've got top researchers from all around the world. The... Uh, the first issue is free, so if you were to go to ufotruthmagazine.com, written as one word, ufotruthmagazine as one word, dot com, you can go there and you can download the first issue for free. After that, it's going to be, in UK terms, the equivalent of £4 uh, or £3.99, uh, and uh, it'll be bi-monthly. It's not a monthly, it's a bi-monthly, six issues a year. Um, but so far, the feedback uh, has been tremendous, uh, both from researchers and uh, the readers who've, who've downloaded it. So 
optimistic that uh, that it will grow and uh, you know and if ever you want to write a piece Nick then I'd more than be happy to have you as a guest contributor uh, and, okay, and I'll be happy to do that no 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 uh, uh, realistically I know that I think you write for the magazines is that right which one sorry do you write for the magazines oh yeah 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 if you want anything I'll be, be pleased to do something yeah so you know, so it, it's still an ongoing process, uh, and uh, I've got um, probably another eight or nine people on board since. Uh, people like Stanton Friedman, who's going to be a guest contributor, uh, Peter Davenport with his National Reporting Centre, uh, Robert Salas with his mission, you know, his uh, nukes uh, or Minuteman missiles in '67. Uh, you know, Ted Phillips has come on board. Um, uh, various people uh, who were going to contribute as uh, guest columnists. Uh, so hopefully, you know, these, these are the top people in the world, uh, invariably. Uh, you know, so if anybody is interested in the subject, hopefully they will take a look and think, well, this is, a, you know, this is really from the horse's mouth, as it were. So, you know, I'm optimistic that it will uh, grow. And I, I guess if you ask me in a year's time, I'll be able to tell you whether it did or not. <laughs> All right, good. And I mean, based on the sort of the people who you've got on board, I'm guessing then this is going to cover the entire sort of spectrum of the UFO subject, from you know abductions, crashes, witness reports, the whole thing. Is that correct? Yes, but it, but here's the here's the premise. There's two, there's two things that make the magazine a bit different. First of all, what it says is this is a magazine for people who believe that some, and I repeat the word, some UFO sightings do represent ET, uh, the extraterrestrial contact engaging with the Earth. That's what I personally believe, and that's based on my circumstantial evidence that I've acquired over many years, the pilots, the astronauts, cosmonauts, generals, admirals, colonels, radar operators, sonar operators, observer corps, etc., etc. For me, none of us have the flying saucer in our back garden because that would be nice but we haven't got it none of us have the alien in the fridge which would be nice but we haven't got it but as a police officer I can say to you that the circumstantial evidence case is what we work on in UFO terms for the simple reason is people get convicted of murder on a circumstantial case sometimes even without the body providing enough pieces of the jigsaw are there and that's mm. my circumstantial evidence. There are, in my opinion, enough pieces there so we can draw a circumstantial evidence conclusion, which is that there's an overwhelming ET element. It's only small. It's uh, 3% of cases worldwide, but that 3% is very significant when you look at the numbers of reports. The other thing yeah. that makes um, UFO Truth magazine considerably different to any other magazine is that I'm not in it for money, I'm in it for the passion for the subject and to try to promote it in a positive way to reach to to wider audience. And what I have done for that is saying that a third of all monies raised through subscriptions, either uh, uh, a single issue subscription or yearly subscriptions, a third of all monies raised for this magazine will be set aside for UFO causes. And what I mean by that in the short term is it will be become the funding mechanism for British ufology, because we haven't got one, and we need one, to get venues, etc., to get speaker costs, etc., uh, flights, uh, travel costs, etc. Uh, but if in time uh, it took off worldwide, and hence why I've got kind of columnists all around the world, English-speaking-wise, Australia, New Zealand, um, obviously the States, uh, Europe, etc., is... Basically, the more people buy this magazine, the bigger that pot of money will be because a third will be ring fenced. Not for me. That third, who's what company is going to give away a third of its profits? None. But I am uh, because I want to do it properly. And that third, the bigger the pot, means that if say Mufon wanted to do a forensic test on an animal mutilation case in the Midwest and needed some funds, well, that if the money is there, they can have a grant towards it or can pay for it. Do you see what I mean? So that's the idea. The idea is there that it's not just for me, it's there for the subject. If you had, uh, if you had for example, 10,000 people worldwide, which is actually a snip 
a drop in the ocean, that would yeah. generate something like £65,000 for this fund. Well, uh, we're not all going to live up in, uh, in, 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 in the Ritz in the UK and spend 65 grand. So there's a lot of money that could be spent to help people around the world doing active research, and that's what I'm going to do. And the other thing that I'll also do as well, if, if you're a serious researcher, then I'll give you a free ad for conferences and things like that, because I don't want the revenue of 300 quid for a, a, yeah. to, to promote a conference. We shouldn't. We should be trying to help each other and promote the subject ourselves. Okay. So this is, I guess, this is as much about not just putting a magazine out, but actually helping the field in return as well, which is obviously a good thing. And I mean, you know, I, unfortunately, I don't get back to Britain as much as I'd like to, but I have noticed on the last few times I've been back, the scene itself seems to be quite fragmented, but it seems to me that you're one of the sort of the few people who's actually thought about how to get that scene back together and revived and, and actually achieve things, you know what I mean? Well, uh, I hope that's how I'm seen. Uh, yes, I am trying to kind of take a lead uh, because everybody says that should um, contact uh, with another intelligent civilization ever happen, hypothetically, that it will be the greatest leap in mankind's history uh, and well I already think that's happened and I hope that you do too but I think that's already happened and I'm trying to just get the word out that says look the media have got this thing sewn up you know the media have painted ufologists out for the last 60 years as, as complete idiots most of the time and there is, the media bias is tremendous so we, we, we kind of uh, we either try to engage with the media uh, in the mainstream and try to make inroads or, as uh, some researchers do, turn the back on the media and just do whatever they want to do uh, uh, on their own volition. Now, I, I take the, uh, the view that, because I quite like working in the media, and it's something I do want to do more, uh, that um, basically we have to engage the mainstream media, but we have to do it in a constructive way. I mean, for example, uh, the last batch of UK files was released a couple of weeks ago, and as usual, every six months, there's a media frenzy to put out the reports. Well, the the batches of, uh, it's the last batch of the MOD files before they close the desk. I mean, they said in 2009 that they're pulling the, pull the desk because of uh, financial cutbacks and they're saving £55,000. Well, the real reason, in my opinion, that they closed was because they were bogged down in freedom of information requests all about UFOs. And with a staff of one, he was bogged down and he couldn't do it. For me, the uh, British release of files is, has been nothing more than a joke. Historically, it's a great exception to have, but most of it is very mundane, low-level correspondence, and certainly don't believe that they released the best stuff. And one of the things that it, by implication it meant was that in 2009, much in the same way that uh, the US Air Force wanted to sign off on Blue Book with the uh, Condom Committee report that sort of said we're not involved in that anymore because there's nothing to it, and everybody knows that that was a whitewash. Uh, I think it was a very similar thing here. This is an attempt by the British government to just draw a line under the subject because it's a pain in the ass to them, uh, and let's close our public relations office because we weren't really doing much. But yeah. here's the thing. By doing that, was there a structured body to replace that uh, reporting desk? And the answer was no. So what you have then is a very fragmented approach to reciting reports. Who do you report to? Now, for a while, uh, it's just been a joke, uh, and, and various sites do their own. But what we really need to do is, is coordinate that in a structured way because the reports don't stop. So, again, with the launch of the magazine, and I've had to wait until I retired to do this because of the constraints that I was under, when the magazine launched on the 25th of June, I also created uh, and launched the uh, United Kingdom UFO Files Reporting Centre. So now there is a site in report form, so if anybody is out there, spread the word. And this is an idea to bring all the uh, UFO sighting agencies and various uh, websites 
to glean all the information, to put it all in one, so we can start to create a clearer picture of what's going on in our skies. And the reason why I've done that is because, one, we need to, because if the media, now the, the uh, MOD are out of it, who are they going to go to for facts and the figures? Well, I'm going to try to create the media vacuum that says, well, you should really be coming to the UK a UFO reporting centre for your facts and figures. Now, I suspect that the media won't come to us initially, but they may have to in time if we get if we do the job properly. Okay. All right, good. Well, we're at the one-hour mark, and um, so I just wanted to let the audience know that if you've got any questions, you can submit them through the live chat room, or you can call in on toll-free 1-888-919-2355. That's toll-free 1-888-919-2355. And uh, if we do get any questions, Gary, we can uh, break to those. But if not, I just wanted to sort of push on a little bit and sort of backtrack to your police um, work or police sightings, I, sh I should say. And I wondered if during the course of your research, you know, you'd ever come across any rumours about crash reports involving the police, things like that? Um, no. Uh, the, an the quick answer to that is, um, I believe there was there was there's been a couple of little snippets, but they've never led yeah. anywhere. Um, oh. There was one in South Yorkshire that I heard about uh, near near Doncaster, uh, but that really didn't go anywhere. It's just a little bit of a story. And then I, I believe, and you're more familiar with this, the Cannock Chase one. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So uh, which you reported in your book. So I mean. Other than that, the answer is no. Most of what, what people are seeing, um, they, they, they see all manner. For example, um, one of the cases that I quoted that the citizens hearing was uh, from a, a, a PC, Robin Perry, uh, uh, and I think he's a Metropolitan officer. And basically, he was on patrol in the mid-80s uh, uh, with his colleague in the Mount police car, when they suddenly saw what they could only describe was a huge triangular craft at low altitude, and I mean by low altitude, we're talking about three or 400 feet. He said it was the size of three football fields, and I said to him, the size of three football fields, how do you know that? And he went, well, it was over three football fields when we saw it. And I thought, well, that's pretty, pretty good. So, you know, pretty accurate. Now... Why is that officer going to make this up? What's he going to gain? Is he going to become famous? Does he risk ridicule? And he's given his name out publicly. Uh, now, he was corroborated by his, his colleague. So, what, you know, why? what's his motivation? He's not going to make money. If anything, he just risks ridicule. So, for me, once I checked him out, he's a very credible source, multiple officer source. Another one uh, in North Yorkshire, these are fairly recent cases. Again, this is in the late 80s. Two is now a retired officer, but uh, this guy was called John Pank. And basically, he was uh, protecting a former, well, he, at the time, he was a very senior uh, conservative um, cabinet minister. So, you know, somebody very eminent and well known. Um, I've never released his name, but it will be in the book if I ever get a chance to write it. But basically, they were guarding him, he and a colleague, on close protection, i.e. weapons, they were firearms experts, and he'd stopped in North Yorkshire overnight in a rural location, uh, just just overnight en route somewhere else up north. And uh, basically, it was a, one of those lovely mornings where at four, sort of five in the morning, the sun's up, there's not a cloud in the sky, lovely bright summer morning, and the two officers who have been up protecting this location in the middle of nowhere are uh, walking around in the grounds of the house when suddenly the sky goes dark and they look up and uh, they're a bit shocked to see that there is a huge cylindrical object hovering above the house, which is a bit of a shock, um, to the point where one of them began to draw his weapon and his mate said, well, what are you going to do to that? And it was kind of a bit of a joke, but they were in awe. Uh, but there was a huge cylindrical object, they said the length of the football field, hovering motionless, no noise, over the house. And they watched it in awe for five minutes. And then suddenly it shot off at an incredible speed, out towards the horizon, stopped, 
sharply for a few seconds and then shot off again in the blink of an eye. Now, again, two officers corroborating each other. What motivation is there for them to lie? And I think the answer is none. They're either just telling you incredible stories. You know, so, but then there's a serving officer in, in the British Transport Police. I won't give her name out because she's a serving officer. But she told me, and this is a sighting in, I think, January of 2012. I think it's actually the most recent sighting I've got. And basically, she is driving a marked car. She's on her own, and it's uh, daylight. And she sees, I think from her left, that she's going along a rural road, what she thinks is a plane just flying very low. But then it's not a plane, it's a sphere, egg-shaped sphere. And basically, this sphere stops in the middle of the road as she's approaching. So she has to slow down, and then suddenly it shoots up into the sky vertically. Well, again, I can't think of anything that we've got, stealth or otherwise, that can do that. You know, and I, I knew this girl personally. Uh, and uh, she's a very credible officer, so I have no doubt what she was telling me was true. Uh, those kind of stories come out, and 70% of the cases on the database are multiple officer. I'm not a big lover of statistics because they can be manipulated. I've seen that over the, with all statistics, and especially the police manipulate statistics, who doesn't? But I don't like that, but basically... The one statistic that stands out from the database is that it's about 70% of the cases are multiple officers. That means out of 425 cases, that's over 300 cases are multiple officers. Now, that, that's a lot harder for the sceptics to deal with. And yeah. I always come at this subject from an en evidential point of view. You know, so uh, it, I, I, the skept I don't mind scepticism at all, providing it's accurate and, yeah. it's, and it's relevant. Unfortunately, what you have, uh, and especially with the way the media works, is that they, because the, the people who make the documentaries really don't have a clue about UFOs, they go into it blind, they don't know good from bad, and they end up, think, because they're so uh, ill-informed, that they think, well, to help us out, really, we'll have a sceptic talking, and we'll have a, an expert talking. Well... When you do cookery, do you have a, a non-cook there? When you have a furniture <laughs> expert, do you have a non-furniture expert there? No, you don't. But when it comes to UFOs, because they don't have a clue, they have got to have a sceptic there. And, and if what they say matched the testimony of the people reporting the event, matched, and, and it, was a, it was a credible point, then fair, fair point. But when it comes on TV, it never does. Well, it's just got to be a star. It's got to be, re you know, it's got to be re a bit of space debris coming back. Yeah, but it was three hours earlier. No, 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 but it's, it's got to be that. It's got to be a flying lighthouse, you know, from all directions. You know, it's, Doctor Who couldn't write it better than a flying lighthouse with Rendlesham. But in every documentary over the last 35 years, this has had a major portion of the show, which is a disgrace because it should have got kicked into touch in the first two minutes because it wasn't credible. The people who were there knew that there was a lighthouse there. And I've been out there at midnight and filmed it, and guess what it does? It shines a beam every five yeah. seconds. Every five seconds. Every five seconds. So even if you were confused, it wouldn't take you more than 15 or 20 seconds to go, that's a lighthouse. Are you with me? Uh, and that's what's not shown in TV. So uh, clever editing can make anything look silly, uh, and, and I kind of want to engage with the media, and I'm trying to actively write... Uh, picture to TV executives now uh, to write and present a TV series showing the best evidence, looking at the best cases, that 3% unknown cases, through my evidential eyes and pointing out what is the best evidence. Um, because I really do think the evidence is there on a circumstantial evidence basis to say that ET is here. But unfortunately, uh, until somebody uh, pulls the finger out in the media... Um, it's not going to happen because there is this media bias. But I do think we are quite close to having a bit of a game changer in the sense that I think I've talked to a number of journalists over the last year or so, and I think the story that's ready to come out in the next year or two, if not sooner, is the fact that they've found microscopic bacterial life on Mars. 
Uh, and once that happens, it doesn't matter what it is. It's, it's life, and it's answered that question. Is the life outside uh, out there? And the answer is yes. And if that comes out, then I would say that's the first brick coming out of the dam in the, the disclosure process because the water will start leaking then because as soon as two little planets going around a little insignificant star like us, We've got over a thousand exoplanets already discovered by likes of Kepler, etc. So uh, we're basically saying any star now has probably got eight to ten planets around them. Now, if we've got life confirmed in any kind of format on Mars, then that means two out of the nine for us. Well, you just extrapolate the figures in just in our Milky Way. You can't even get your head around the numbers, and it would probably mean that for every star, the trillions and trillions and trillions of stars, there's eight to ten planets, of which some will be in the Goldilocks zone, the so-called not-too-hot, not-too-cold zone, like the Earth, uh, and basically may well support life. Now, the argument then for distances completely goes out the window. It's untenable, because what happens if a civilization uh, developed ahead of Earth time by 500 years, 1,000 years? What if it's half a million years ahead of us? Do you think they'll still be driving around in the, in petrol-driven cars? Or do you think they'll be driving around in in the jet engines, in the aircraft? I don't think so. We're, look at where we've gone just in the last thousand years. You you can't believe the, uh, the, the leap just in the last hundred years since the Wright brothers, 1903. And look, here we are now going to the far edges of our solar system and beyond. You can't... Right. You can't uh, comprehend. So I think all that's happening... I mean, I, I often use this example that if you went to Leonardo da Vinci, who was arguably the greatest mind of a 500-year generation, and passed him an iPad and said, work that one out, Leonardo, he wouldn't have a clue because the leap in technology is too much. Now, what happens if UFOs have developed a 1,000 years ahead of Earth time? Well... If we compare that with Earth technology, where are we going to be? Where is mankind's technology going to be in terms of propulsion systems in a fi- in a hundred years, five hundred years? We ain't going to be driving around in cars. We aren't going to be using jet engines. We would have developed new methods faster and faster. And what did it do? It used to take uh, weeks and weeks to travel the seas, and now we can do it in hours, literally. It used to fly around the Earth. We, you know, the, the Blackbird in the 50s and 60s could go around the Earth in three hours. You know, that was technology then. So the world will shrink, and in space will shrink as technologies uh, evolve. But, you know, if a civilization has developed technology ahead of us, well, why can't they just have worked out better methods of propulsion? Yeah. You see, it really is a nonsensical, very narrow-minded uh, astronomical argument that, that really did not work for me at all. Okay. And something that just occurred to me out of the blue, I didn't plan this question, but um, bearing in mind, you know, the fact that you focus so much on the police, I just wondered, do you get uh, reports also from you know, other aspects of the emergency services, like the fire brigade and, you know, ambulance drivers, that sort of thing? I've had the occasional one, uh, uh, but the answer is, realistically speaking, no, I've had the odd one. But I've had, you know, I've had, I've had reporters, I've had architects, I've had doctors, um, accountants and people like that, and they will say, um, I can't go public with this because I'll lose my business. And I think that's a terrible indictment to society that these yep. very credible people who would normally be looked at uh, as, as leading citizens of, in mm-hmm. their communities are suddenly, because of this subject and because of the way that the media has treated it over the last 60 years, they're almost demonised for having been involved in something that was beyond their control uh, that they probably don't understand. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've had police officers almost crying on the phone when I spoke to them the first time because they've been able to unload something that happened 20 years previously, but they've never been able to tell the wife or the girlfriend or the, or, or, or the, the family. You know, and suddenly they've got somebody who's not going to ridicule them, somebody who is going to listen sympathetically, and they, and, and they found it very moving. And it's almost been like a, a cathartic counselling kind of uh, uh, session. And, and and I think it's a terrible indictment the way that the media uh, has uh, treated people in this subject because how, how can you, 
trivialise a military pilot being sent up like Milton Torres in 1957 to uh, uh, over Ipswich in the, in, uh, in Suffolk, funnily enough, near Embleton, but the, to, to fly his plane and he gets told flying his super saber, an American pilot over Britain, is told to fire his 24 rockets at a, a radar confirmed UFO. And when he does so, they won't fire. Now, th- th- this kind of information just generally doesn't reach the media, and it should. Uh, and uh, the citizens hearing, his son had actually turned up, because he, uh, unfortunately, Milton Torres is in poor health, and his son spoke, and he said it's absolutely scandalous that these people who fight for the country in, in Korea, Vietnam, etc., all around the world, in different theatres of war, who would normally be deemed as experts, are suddenly trivialised. And he said it's absolutely wrong, and it is absolutely wrong. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I agree with you. And I think, you know, the, the fault is with the media. And I think a lot of it is just lazy journalism, you know. It's not like the information is not there for them to find it. They can find it. But all they're interested in is sort of, you know, selling a series to this channel and then a series on something else, you know, to another channel. And, and they're not, like you said, they're not experts in the field. They don't really know much about it. And yet they're the ones who are dictating what appears. And then you have the byproduct of, you know, the witnesses made to look stupid or whatever. So. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, it's not surprising, and it's worked incredibly well, this media bias, which I think originates from the Robertson panel in 53, which was CIA uh, put together, um, really, where they said then we're going to have to strip the aura of UFOs, of, of flying saucers, as it was then, uh, and we've got to actively engage with the media to dumb it down, and, and that's what they've done ever since. So it's not rocket science. So for the last 60 years, if you were brought up uh, and you're under the age of 60, you are generally, other than your parents, you're going to learn everything about life from books, radio, TV, newspaper, and the cinema. And that's your media input. And if your media input is saying there is nothing to this subject, you are going to have a subtle brainwashing technique that says there's nothing to the subject. So if the man on the street is suddenly put a camera up to him and say, do you believe in uh, UFOs and ET? He'll probably go, well, there's a lot of, like, you know, might be life in space, but I don't believe in it now, kind of thing. But that is going to change, and uh, we need to engage with the media and get them to realise that the, there is some very credible evidence, uh, and that's, again, why I'm trying to reach out uh, to media executives or whatever, because I want to make a groundbreaking series. And it will happen sooner rather than later, for the simple reason, because of Mars. Because when that life is out there, they will then, TV executives may just have to think, what if, what if, for the very first time, and I think the time will be right then for a TV series to tell the truth. All right, cool. And just to go back to something that you briefly mentioned earlier, you said you were potentially were, or you're planning, I think you're doing a book about your entire research as well. Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, if people can find the time, yes, I've got a book. <laughs> I've mo- and I, I really should have a book. I know that. Everybody says you should have a book about your police yeah, case. Should. And, and I should. But believe it or not, um, when I was in the police, I tried on many, many occasions to go through to mainstream publishers and say, look, there's not another book like it. There's never been a book totally dedicated to police officers anywhere in the world. Unique selling factor. But no one publisher would go for it. Uh, So now, in the end, I'll probably have to self-publish unless somebody steps out of the woodwork. But yes, I do have more than enough material for the book. uh, And uh, there will be a chapter on the discipline because I think it was totally wrong. And I was basically disciplined for my beliefs which was wrong and uh, and it's really a question of now starting the magazine and you know like I'm saying I've got my fingers into lots of things I'd like to write and present a TV series I'm trying to promote the Rendlesham script uh, doing the magazine there are only so many hours in the day plus you have a life you have a you know a lovely wife you know you're not going to have that if you devote all your time to everything else other than her. So it's striking a balance, which is difficult. But yes, uh, I would like to do the book, and I keep saying, yeah, I'm going to do it this year. I think realistically I've got to concentrate on the magazine and seeing that that becomes a success, because I think it will. Uh, and I want, it, I want 
UFO Truth magazine to be the top publication in the world because of the caliber of people who's writing for it. That's my lofty ambition. Whether it happens, I don't know, but that's my ambition. Uh, and uh, so I think I've got to really focus on the magazine at the moment. But yes, at some point I will do a book. All right, good. And we're down to about the last 10 minutes, Gary. I guess one of the most important questions to sort of, you know, round things up on, based on all your research, I know you, you consider that, you know, a small percentage or a right percentage of UFO sightings are evidence of extraterrestrial visits. What do you feel is sort of the, the purpose behind these visits or the presence here? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for a long time, I never used to say anything because people would ask me at conferences and whatever, but I'd say, look, I really just concentrate on trying to show you the best evidence. It's not really for me to do that. But people do kind of ask you as as, as more prominent that you become. People do look for kind of direction from you. Um, so what I would say is there are a few things after 60 years of the modern new era of your force from, say, 45 onwards and the Foo Fighters, the Second World War, you know, so we're looking at almost 70 years, really, in that respect. In the modern era, there is a uh, preponderance of sightings that link UFOs to an interest in nuclear weapons, nuclear bases, nuclear power plants. Now, you could argue why, and the most logical reason is that perhaps they don't want to see the Earth destroyed for whatever reason. I tend to think that that's probably true. Um, I think they've been around for a long time. Uh, in the modern era, you'd have to say that, on the whole, it would appear to be benign, although if you take the abduction uh, scenario uh, seriously, which I do, and the animal mutilation um, uh, aspect is, is real, which I do, then you'd have to say, well, that's not very benign. Uh, and we don't really know what the agenda is. I think there are probably many species that come here. But the way I kind of look at why they're coming is, I think the best way to look at it is that we're a bit like the Great Barrier Reef. When we, uh, everybody's heard of the Great Barrier Reef, and everybody says it's one of the great ones of the natural world. Uh, when we go swimming to see in the Great Barrier Reef, we don't break off the coral, do we? Because we don't want to harm the environment, the natural habitat. Uh, and I think that in our neck of this part of the galaxy, that the Earth is pretty special in the sense that it's got vast amounts of water, life and fauna. And I think that that makes it a bit of an oasis in our little bit of uh, cosmic neighbourhood. And I think that's why they come here whether it's an element of space tourism, whether it's uh, we just surveil, we could be like ants, so primitive on the scale of things. We have to have an open mind here. You know, the, the people that say, you know, we're, you know, we're at the centre of the universe, it's absolute rubbish. We do, we're just at the start of our evolutionary phase in, t in terms of being sentient beings. And so who knows where we're going to be in our consciousness in a thousand years' time. Uh, the reality is that if other species have developed, then we might just be cosmic ants who just come on the radar probably because of the atomic bomb going off. That probably sent a shockwave, and they thought, oh, that little nice planet with all its life and fauna, well, they've now developed a technological capability to destroy themselves. And the planet, well, we don't like that, because we like going to that planet. We like studying the Great Barrier Reef. And I think that's kind of where you've got to look at it. There's a much bigger picture going on, and I think we're just very small pawns, and there's a lot to be discovered in the next few years. Okay. And do you think the phenomenon itself will ever reveal itself to us, or do you think it's up to us to kind of keep pushing for answers? I think it's a, I think I think UFOs operate on extremely many different levels. I concentrate on the physical side of things, trying to prove in the media that there are nuts and bolts sightings and dog fights and whatever and structured craft, because there are, because the evidence is there. But also there is the abduction side, but there is also the people who are spiritual, uh, who are able to uh, communicate. Now, it's not something I can do. I've never tried to do it. But I know many people who are credible people who say they can do it. So who am I to say that it's not a 
uh, uh, one aspect of the communication. Just because I can't do it doesn't mean that it doesn't, it's not real. So I just concentrate on the physical aspects, but I think that it works on many, many different levels. And there are people who can channel and communicate with ET. I can't, never tried, but who's to say that it's real or not? But I think that it's a very complicated system uh, issue. There are, you know, uh, many different facets to it uh, that you can't just describe in a, in, a, in a minute or two of conversation. It's very yeah. complicated, but I think, is there any evidence that there is a physical side to it? Yes, there is, and that's where I come from. Uh, because I'm trying to take on the media that said that as a 15-year-old, when I had my sighting, that there's nothing to this subject. And yet, straight away, as a 15-year-old, I'm right, reading about pilots engaging in dogfights with mm. structured craft and firing their weapons at the craft. I mean, there was, a, there was an absolutely perfect example of what I would say the reality of the physical nature of UFOs is. Uh, at the citizens' hearing, there was a Peruvian pilot called Colonel Oscar Santa Maria, and he, he came on and he told his first hand experience of being sent to, vectored towards a radar confirmed UFO in broad daylight, and he saw it and he initially thought it was a, a balloon. And he was told to fire his, his uh, machine guns at it, which he did, and let off 64 rounds, and it had no effect, and he expected it to blow up because he thought it was a balloon. And then suddenly, this object suddenly went up into the air vertically at high speed by about 10,000 feet in a few seconds. He then went to follow it. It jumped again, and he ended up with an 18-minute dogfight with, which, with a structured object. Now, and the rounds didn't have any effect. Now, you cannot get better testimony as to the reality of the physical nature of this subject than that. So whilst there are many aspects to it, spiritual, uh, different, uh, transcendental, etc., there is certainly a physical side. What it is, for certain, I don't know, but for me, it's certainly not anything that we've got uh, constructed on it. Okay, all right, cool. Well, we're down to the wire. We've got just a couple of minutes to go, so I'll just give out your information again, uh, or part of it, then I'll leave the rest to you. We've got the Prufos Police Database, uh, which can be accessed at Prufos, P-R-U-F-O-S, policedatabase.co.uk, where you can find details of many of the reports that Gary's investigated and logged. And, Gary, do you want to tell people again, just remind them of the name of the magazine and the website where they can obtain it? Yeah, there's a, the magazine's all up and running now. First issue free. It's a bi-monthly easy. It's called UFO Truth Magazine. Put into Google. Any search engine, it will come back straight away at the top of Google, uh, and uh, it will take you straight to the website. UFO Truth Magazine, written as one word, dot .com. Uh, take you to the website, and there you can download the first issue for free and take you uh, and have a read and, and, and engage and see the quality of the articles that's in there. Uh, and, 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 and if anybody wants to email me, they can email me at Hazeltine Gary, my name in reverse, at hotmail.com. Uh, I'll give you my mobile, 07970-364-368. I have nothing to hide. I'm here, uh, and I'm just trying to really get the message out that there is a lot to this subject, and it's very credible. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Gary. I mean, really, I think we covered an amazing amount of ground and also it's clear to me you know that you're what we need somebody who's passionate and enthusiastic and who's trying to kick open doors and follow you know pretty much every avenue to get the word out which which is what we need you know and, and i think you're doing a great job with everything that you're doing so that's good well i i appreciate you giving me the opportunity to 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 help uh, launch the magazine because you know, like any any new venture, it needs the air of publicity to make it work and let people know. So I appreciate you on, uh, and 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 I want to say that you're you know you, you I'm a big fan of your earliest works. Uh, you know, a cosmic crashes and a covert agenda, fantastic books. Covert agenda is one of my top ten books in the subject. Oh, well, thanks, Gary. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All righty. Well, we're just literally down to the wire now. So I'd just again like to thank Gary Hesseltine very much for coming on the show tonight and to thank all the listeners as well. Uh, I'm Nick Redfern for Epic Voyages. Be sure to tune in next week at 8 p.m. Central right here on Inception Radio Network. Good night. <laughs>
Please join us again next Monday evening for Extraordinary Phenomena Investigations Council's Epic Voyages. I'm Roger Peacock for Epic. Until next time. <laughs>